this is what I think is the most costly and damaging thing that's happening, is that in, in pursuing some, what I think is pie in the sky solution with the Chinese that they're never going to agree to ultimately, the church has lost sight of the audience it needs to speak to most, and that is the people of China and particularly the Catholics of China. People mm -hmm. don't respond to your diplomatic skills or your, your, your pursuit of a political deal. They, they respond to heroism. So when Cardinal Kung picked up the microphone and said, long live Christ the King, it cost him dearly, but I'm sure that resonated in the hearts of China's Catholics and kept their faith alive in the, the, during the Cultural Revolution, which was uh, an abysmal time. Hello there, David, how are you? Good, thank you. And uh, thank you for agreeing to do this interview. And I'm uh, very pleased to be able to do this. And the people watching, uh, let me introduce David Mulroney. So currently you are a fellow at the University of Toronto in Canada at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. But what's particularly relevant to this interview is that you are a, were a career diplomat with several postings in Asia and above all Canadian ambassador to China from 2009 to 2012, which is obviously a very, very senior posting and um, incredibly important and relevant in today's world, given the rising power of China in the world. So what I intend to do with this interview, um, uh, we're gonna get around to discussing the recent Vatican uh, China renewal of a deal. I think that went back two years um, to do with the appointment of bishops, although it's never been published. So we talk about that soon. But what I want to do is spend a little bit of time talking, first of all, about uh, the rise of China and its place in the world, what we should think of it, what we should make of its leader, Xi Jinping, and how worried we should be. Um, so we might just go back a little bit to your time in China for those three years. What were your and what are your overwhelming impressions of that country? Sure. And, and I was lucky enough, as you say, to have had a number of postings to China and, and uh, one posting to Taiwan. And then I dealt with Asia a lot from Ottawa at the headquarters. So I saw China in you know, various stages of its evolution uh, after the upheavals of the Cultural Revolution in the 70s. I, I first served in Shanghai in the mid 80s when uh, Deng Xiaoping, the um, much purged and, and you know, long surviving uh, lieutenant to Mao Zedong uh, was finally uh, more or less in the driver's seat and he was helping China come out of the chaos of the Cultural Revolution. And the mid 80s was actually a time of experimentation with things like grassroots democracy. Uh, people were look, open to new ideas and, and Shanghai being to China, what say New York City is to the United States, a place of media and ideas, it was an interesting place to be. Uh, but that opening and, and the, you know, the freedom culminated in tragedy at the end of the decade in 1989 at Tiananmen, when the Chinese authorities in response to growing demand by students and workers and others for political reforms, just couldn't move quickly enough and seized up and uh, turned the army on the protesting students in Tiananmen Square. And it was a horrible massacre. Which is, which is the main square in Beijing. Main square in Beijing. And so that mm. put China back uh, into isolation. And again, uh, it took uh, Deng Xiaoping to, to bring them out. And what he did was to say, um, you know, we're not going to embrace political reform. We're going to embrace economic reform. And in addition to the, the, the shock of Tiananmen, the, the massacre, the Chinese also had, and other communist countries had the great shock of the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was the guiding star for every communist country in the world. And the Chinese were particularly assiduous in following, uh, the, the Soviets drove them crazy, but they followed them carefully. So here's this model, the model has collapsed, uh, but they kept their heads down, they focused on economic reform, and that caused a lot of people in the West to say, well, they're not really communist. They're, they're giving up on this. They're, they're pragmatic. They're, um, they're like us. They, you know, they, they want prosperity and the best for their family, which is true to a certain extent, except they never stopped being communist. And um, I saw, I worked uh, as the head of the Asia branch in Ottawa in, in the early part of this new millennium in the early 2000s. Um, 
And then I went out to China as ambassador uh, at the end of the decade. And that also, of course, coincided with the global economic crisis. And here for the first time, it was China that was surviving and in fact um, doing quite well uh, with a major stimulus program. And it was China that everybody, including the Americans, turned to to um, you know pull the fat out of the fire and 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 to help uh, the world survive. And the world began to put a court to China uh, at the end of the first decade of this new millennium. And uh, in a way that really suggested that China could do no wrong. That China, you know, we've seen the future and it's China. And I used to see Canadians coming to the embassy and they felt very much mm-hmm. like this. And of course the Chinese, you, sometimes you you believe your own headlines, right? You, you, you begin to think that you are infallible if everybody is telling you that. So uh, the leader at that time, Hu Jintao, um, responded to this by encouraging uh, the Chinese to make the most of this, to sort of celebrate this, uh, to, to make sure that they got full credit for what they were doing. Then she, uh, Hu Jintao was followed by the current leader, Xi Jinping, who's a, a different sort of leader altogether, very ambitious, but a person who believes that the ultimate future of China must always involve the Communist Party. His father and was heard. He had organized the Olympics, right, which was regarded as a major success. Yes, he was a rising star. His father uh, had been uh, one of Mao's uh, lieutenants and, and was purged in the Cultural Revolution. She Mm -hmm. himself, like many people, she is a year older than I am. He was sent down to the countryside. He'd been a coddled, you know, young princeling. He was, you know, son of an elite person. All of that went to nothing. And he he was working out in the back of the beyond. But he didn't take from that a hatred of the party. He took from that the sense that the only safe place is within the party. So Mm -hmm. she takes, takes over, you know, in the 2012 to 2014 period. And all of a sudden, he begins to sound an even more aggressive note that you know, China is, is going to uh, achieve a new relationship with the United States, a new kind of great power relationship, that he is going to revive the Chinese dream, that he is going to sna- uh, crack down on, on corruption, but that every institution in Chinese life is going to have to be very much uh, you know, driven by the Communist Party. It has to adhere to the guidelines of the Communist Party, and that China is no longer going to be you know, cautious when it comes to international relations, it's going to show the world who's boss. And we've seen mm-hmm. that uh, not just in China, not just in Asia, but with a Chinese interference that's felt everywhere from, you know, Ireland to Canada to Australia, Sweden, uh, India, you name it. So we're into a very different situation now with a China that uh, is much more assertive, much more aggressive. And the, the one uh, consideration to keep in mind is China is still governed by fairly conservative people. So they're watching Xi Jinping aggressively push this Chinese agenda, but they're also worried. This isn't their style. They used to mm-hmm. say, hide your capabilities and bide your time. She is mm-hmm. doing this. So she is being watched. He's purged a lot of people. He's pushed a lot of people to the side. They haven't gone away. So the risk for Xi and for China is that this overreach um, comes back to haunt him. And, and I, for one, believe that that's just what might happen. So he gets, um, he gets basically purged himself, is what you're saying, is it? Well, the, 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 the one little difficulty in all of this is up until she arrived on the scene, China watchers, and uh, myself included, would have said that there are some encouraging signs in what the Chinese are doing. They're not democratizing. But we're moving from one person rule, which is what we had when Mao Zedong was the leader, Mm -hmm. to at least rule by the standing committee of the Politburo. So that's nine people and and sometimes getting nine people to decide on an idea is better than having one person. You also have the Chinese introducing term limits. Mr. Xi has two jobs. He's the president of China. That's actually his less important job. He's also the chairman of the Communist Party of China. And so Mm -hmm. the term on the presidency has been extended indefinitely. So there's no exit plan for Xi. And that that's difficult. That that puts a real strain on the system, because in the past, China was getting to a situation where you knew that if somebody didn't work out, at least his due date would come up. Xi has abandoned his due date. And he's also 
uh, attacked others who are in the standing committee. His anti-corruption campaign has made his colleagues at the very top uh, feel, feel the pain. That's also uh, very risky because it means you can't retire. If you've gone after people as the boss, the worry is mm -hmm. the next boss will go after you. So the indications are that she is in no hurry to you know, hand over the reins of power. That's another factor that I think will ultimately contribute to a, a destabilizing uh, effect in China. Um, most countries, um, and certainly Ireland is one of them, uh, about the only thing that concerns us in our relationship with China is trade. And human rights take an extremely distant backseat compared with that. There's kind of a little bit of lip service and Ireland will sign on to the odd kind of medium out of the UN or EU statement about it. Um, but apart from that, very, very little. So what's happened in Hong Kong basically glossed over what's happening to the Uyghur Muslims in the west of the country, um, also being glossed over. And all the internal things going on apart from that, all being glossed over. Um, do you, I mean, how would you like to see Western powers respond to China and what's happening? Well, the reality is, you know, there's a reason why countries like Ireland, Canada is going through the same thing. Australia feels it, you know, even the United States, Britain certainly feels it, because China is an entirely new creature. We all had our concerns about the Soviet Union, but the Soviet mm. Union wasn't an economic power. It didn't make anything particularly that we wanted to buy. Uh, it mm. wasn't, uh, it didn't have an in, uh, impact on markets. It didn't create jobs. It was a military power and, and it was dealt with in a fairly straightforward way through a military uh, competition with, with NATO, which it ultimately couldn't afford to, to stay in. Mm -hmm. China, there's a lot that China is doing that is very attractive to the West. Chinese companies are doing, Chinese technology companies are rightly accused of stealing from uh, the West or from wherever they can get the technology, but they're also pretty good. You know, they're, they're, there's a reason why they're succeeding. So China has mm -hmm. created some things that are beneficial. It's also important for us, as we, gosh, you know, we, we've seen these days to come to work closely with China in things like global healthcare, uh, in the, the global environment. You, we can't ignore China. So for the first time, we've got this state that is important, uh, the, that you know creates a lot of reasons for cooperation, but that is also fundamentally antagonistic. And how do how do you calibrate that? How do you get that right? I think what you have to do is you have to manage the relationship very carefully. And one of the critiques I've had of Canada is that we we've gone for something that I call comprehensive engagement. Any idea is a good idea, and that's easy because you don't have to do much thinking. But it's also very risky. Not every idea with China is a good idea. Not every form of collaboration is a good idea. You have to be careful about interference and espionage. But we also have a stake in a rules-based international order. And China is busy unraveling that at home and also abroad. And we have to first call them out on that. We have to, when it comes to other countries, when it comes to Africa, when it comes to the Americas and Central Asia, we have to provide a compelling alternative version and reach out and, and help other countries. And we've got to work together as democracies in ways that will get China's attention. China likes to bluster, but it takes on countries one by one. What's interesting about Xi Jinping is he's got a lot of people that he's taking on one by one, including the Indians now. Um, mm -hmm. Donald Trump gave them fits. Uh, they're, uh, you know, daggers drawn with the Australians. Um, so he's got a lot of people who are um, mad at him, but up to now, it's basically been one-on-one -on -one contests. If we work together, not ganging up on China, but comparing notes and saying things like, no, you can't kidnap our nationals, as they've done to Canada and to Ireland, it would appear, mm -hmm. and to Sweden and mm -hmm. other countries, when you're mad at us and put us under pressure because we are democracies and we care about our people. Hostage diplomacy is not acceptable and it has consequences. Canada has introduced a, a, a move to condemn hostage diplomacy, but it's got no teeth as yet. And I'd, I'd like to see it have sanctions. So we've got to work together mm -hmm. to call China out when it so clearly violates norms and standards. What I'm most concerned about right now is the coming Winter Olympics next year in Beijing. Canada mm -hmm. uh, is not a global sports power 
but we are in a Winter Olympics power and we take the Winter Olympics very seriously, particularly the hockey dimension of that. So it's, it's a bit uh, sacrilegious in Canada to be saying we should not attend the Winter Olympics. But I don't see, China uses events like Olympics as a way of summoning the world to pay tribute. It's a mm -hmm. bread and, and it's also a kind of a bread and circuses campaign for the people in China. And nobody throws a better circus than the Chinese. So while there's a, a political dimension of you know wanting to send a message to China, there's a moral dimension as Canada. I would argue that we cannot go and wave our flag and celebrate and pay tribute in Beijing while a million or more. Muslim Uyghurs are incarcerated at the other end of the country. I don't. I also think we can't go when they've got two of our Canadian city, citizens imprisoned in retaliation for a, a complaint they have about our extradition process for a Chinese um, uh, mm -hmm. a Chinese business person. So it, 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 we haven't figured it out. Nobody's figured it out. But I'm more encouraged that there's more conversations happening. Uh, globally about how we respond to this. Yeah. I mean, the Vatican appears to have taken the view of the Holy See that um, the rise of China is a fait accompli, more or less, and they've got to deal, they've got to deal with this government and come up with a kind of realistic, prudential agreement under the circumstances about the status of Catholics in China. Um, you might, first of all, maybe tell viewers um, a bit about the patriotic church versus the underground church as the kind of background. So when the uh, communists uh, took over in 1949, they inherited a, a China that had basically been in chaos since the end of the, the great dynasty, since the end of the Qing dynasty early in the 20th century. And there've been warlords, the Japanese had invaded the the Republicans under Chiang Kai-shek had controlled things to a certain extent, but they certainly hadn't controlled all of China. But you had, uh, in religious terms, in addition to China's own uh, home, homegrown religion of Taoism and its moral guidance through Confucianism, you had Islam, which still exists in, in China, but you also had Protestantism and Catholicism. Catholicism, Catholicism. Was, in, was introduced uh, early by uh, Matteo Ricci. Well, it was. It, there were Nestorian Christians in China in the 7th and 8th centuries, but uh, the Jesuits uh, entered China in you know, the sort of 16th, 17th, late in the uh, 16th century. Uh, and um, that lasted for a time, but didn't last forever. Um, then you had both Catholics and Protestants entering China in the 19th century in the period of you know, colonial exchanges, and, and Chinese would call it colonialism. Um, so you, you, there were a lot of Chinese Christians uh, in 1949. And although the, the communists made nice in their rhetoric, uh, by the early 1950s, they were making it clear that the only way you could be a, a Christian in China is to belong to one of a number of state-controlled churches. So the Protestants were all glommed together, the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Anglicans were all glommed together into a, a kind of a Protestant group. And the Catholics were put into a separate group. Th th there's a reason for that, which is kind of interesting, but was also kind of frustrating. Um, Protestantism in, in Chinese is called uh, Ji Du Zhao, Ji Du being Jesus. It's the Jesus mm. faith. But mm. Matteo Ricci, a couple of hundred years before the Protestants, had been, like most Jesuits, very clever, but maybe, maybe too clever. So he used the name, when they said, what is your faith? He, he used the name, you know, the, the sort of heavenly kingdom, the heavenly deity, Tianzhu. So Catholics are called Tianzhu Zhao, the faith of the, the heavenly way or the heavenly deity. Mm. So the Chinese often believe that there are Christians called Protestants, and then there are these other guys called Catholics. So, so they would say to me, are you a Catholic or a Christian? Which sometimes can be <laughs> a very pointed question. Um, but we had, so you had these, these two communities. And what the, the, the government said, you, you now have to join our state affiliated churches. Uh, that meant that a lot of the, the uh, foreigners who were involved in Protestant churches were imprisoned or, or fled, left China. Uh, and the Catholics, uh, China, Catholic Church of China had been successful in um, identifying and, and promoting uh, Chinese uh, men and women for leadership roles in, in the various um, 
uh, orders, um, including one of my personal heroes, um, Cardinal Kung, who was the oh. Archbishop of Shanghai. And uh, he was arrested in 55 and told to go to a, he was taken to a sports stadium and, and asked uh, to uh, really repudiate his faith and declare his loyalty to the uh, People's Republic of China. And when the, the microphone was passed to him, he said, long live uh, Christ the King, long live the Pope. And he spent mm -hmm. 30 years in prison for that. I met him when he was just released mm -hmm. from prison. And it's one of the times in my life when I think I've been in the presence of a saint. Mm. But the, I can just cut in. Um, sorry, David. I mean, so, so basically the choice for Catholics was you join the state affiliated church or you go underground. Or you go underground. Uh, and the bishops of the state affiliated church were not being recognized by Rome. Exactly. Uh, that basically it. And, and so it was very cruel and very, and in the Cultural Revolution, the conditions were almost impossible. So churches were turned into uh, storage sheds and granaries and, and things like that. Everything was smashed. There was iconoclasm and, and windows, stained glass windows were destroyed and, and uh, priests and nuns. Yeah, we were treated terribly. Then you got, and you know, in, in China, um, the Chinese are not immune to the possibility or they're, they're not unaware that if they're trying to woo foreigners, being seen to be friendly to religion can be a help. So by the 80s and 90s, they were allowing religions to operate a little bit more freely. So when I lived in, in Shanghai, I could go to mass at the, the great cathedral in, in Shanghai, although it was, and I, for a Catholic, it's a kind of a dicey situation because it's the, it's not quite, quite legit. Um, by the end of the, um, the century, there, there was a degree of quiet cooperation with the Vatican. And there were priests who were known to be, although they were forced to be members of the patriotic church, they were known to be loyal. So there was this, this mix. And uh, early in the, the current century, um, Pope Benedict wrote a wonderful letter, I think it's 2008 or 2009, no, 2008, to the Chinese people, where he talks about this and says, we, you know, we need to heal this split. We shouldn't see uh, ourselves as, as being separated. We, you know, we need to show charity. But he was very clear in his letter and saying, but the appointment of the people who stand before you, your, your bishops, has to come through the Bishop of Rome. And, and that's not because we've thought of that. It's because that responds to the directive that Christ our Lord himself gave to St. Peter, that th 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 this is necessary. So he was very mm. charitable and inclusive, as we'd say in, in you know, contemporary language, but he was very mm. clear on what had to happen. And so th this was still uh, un unresolved. Under th the current uh, Pope, the efforts have been made once again to, to kind of bridge this gap. And I worry, frankly, David, that the, the Vatican diplomats and, and the approach is an approach that I'm familiar with in other areas. Certain foreigners are absolutely seduced by China. They mm. see it there, and there are some very seductive things. You can look at the way they've countered poverty and the improvements they've brought to the country and the, the things, and particularly, you know, at the end of, in 2008, 2009, when we were all, you know, seeing, uh, our economies crash, and in some places, like in the U.S., uh, political chaos, uh, chaos in Europe. Um, you, you, you could begin to question. Uh, there, were, there was a very strong push to say, not only do the Chinese have the economy right, but you know they they can really run a government in ways that we can't. I, I actually heard mm. Canadians say that. And in fact, our own prime minister, before he became prime minister, was asked which country. He most admired, and he said, "Well, I, you know, I have to say, I admire China's basic dictatorship." He has since mm. <laughs> walked back from that, but I think some of the Vatican negotiators were seduced by the Chinese because there's a fundamental reality, and that is that the Ch the Chinese Communist Party will allow no other organization, no movement, nothing on this earth to. Share to, to claim a share of, of national power. Everything 
that operates at the level of civil society, politics, governance in China, all comes under the leadership of the party. I mean, I guess in Chinese history, I mean, I've done a little bit of reading about China. I'm trying to kind of brush up and catch up because you can't ignore, you know, the second most powerful country in the world. Um, uh, if you consider yourself to be following, you know, current affairs and maybe soon to be the most powerful country. And uh, you see, in, in, like in Chinese history and like in Western history, um, so in Western history, the king, if you like, has always, and the state has always had a rival in for the affections of people in the shape of the church. Um, and this actually has helped to give rise to Western pluralism and so on. You know, the things of Caesar and the things of God. Whereas in China, kind of everything is from Caesar's, which is to say the emperor and the state. And it's never really broke any rivals in the sense of another big institution smack bang in the middle of Chinese society and civilization that can rival the power of the emperor for the affections and loyalties of people. Um, and so the church is probably seen as a pretty threatening thing because it, it creates another focus of loyalty, affection and authority compared to the state. And they just won't broke that. And in fact, in Chinese history, there's never been anything like that. So it probably seems incredibly strange and threatening to them. Would that be fair enough? Well, it, absolutely. And I think there are a couple of other recent uh, triggers for the Chinese. One is that in the 19th century, you had the, um, a number of major religious movements rise up in China, the Taipings, the Boxers, mm -hmm. and very nearly brought the empire uh, to its knees uh, millions killed in, in battles with these forces. So there's a great fear of folk religion rising up to challenge authority. And then there is the inevitable connection between Western religions and Christianity in particular, and a colonial era that China sees and also promotes as being humiliating. Mm. The reality, of course, is that there, there are probably some unfortunate connections between at least some missionary activities and you know, colonial objectives. But by and large, the, the people who were reforming Chinese society uh, were very often the Christians. The hospital system was built, the education mm. system was built. You know, there, I'm, I, I wrote a book about Canada-China relations and I was interested that there, there was a missionary couple, husband and wife, who'd come out from Canada in the late 19th century and he, uh, they both helped to create one of the largest medical universities in the world, along with some other uh, Protestant missionaries. Uh, but they worked in things like the Anti-Foot Binding League and the mm. creation of a Red Cross. So there, there was a great contribution that um, foreigners have, and, and foreign missionaries have brought to China that is unrecognized. The yeah, I was reading, sorry, David, I was reading that... Um the first hospital in Wuhan, where, of course, the virus appears to have broken out, was a Franciscan missionary yes. back in about 1880. And, and the Chinese would not acknowledge, we had a, a reunion of what they call in Canada the Mish kids. These are mm. children of Canadian Protestant missionaries, who, by the way, are it's hard to get them together because they are all of very different factions. And some mm. of them were mm. very radicalized and so ended up supporting the communists. Others were... Uh, very evangelical Christian. So there's a, a broad spectrum of, of Protestant connection uh, to China, but the Chinese welcomed them back, but only referred to them as, as volunteers. And they have an mm. even harder time recognizing the contribution that Catholics made. And I used to find when I'd go, there's an organization in China that controls all activity with religions and it's called SARA, the State Administration of Religious Affairs. And I would go in and, and uh, ask about issues of religious freedom. And in China, you're told you'll have 60 minutes. So the head of Sarah would come in and speak to me for 58 minutes and then say, mm -hmm. ah, Ambassador Mulroney, now <laughs> for your two minutes. So <laughs> it was, it, they, they made it kind of tough, but he would say things like, we're very proud that we have now cynicized the church. And this is a key word in terms of what's happening, i.e. rendered it more Chinese. And we mm -hmm. have, you know, our priests are Chinese and it's not controlled. And I said, you know- Which uh, means more loyal to the state, in fact, doesn't it? I said, you know, I've been to mass in many languages, including, you know, in Cambodian and, you know, every European language practically, uh, obviously French and English in Canada. Uh, but I've never 
thought about the nationality of the priest. And what bothers the Chinese about Catholicism is the same thing that bothers them about the other religions that are most problematic in Chinese eyes, Tibetan mm. Buddhism and Islam. Because these are religions that are global, that transcend borders, and that derive their spiritual energy from multiple sources that can't mm -hmm. be confined within a border. And what China wants is religions that are Chinese, fit into the Chinese organogram, and stop at the, the borders of China. So they're, they're made uneasy about the globalized nature, the first you know, truly global organization is, is the Catholic Church in many mm. ways. So uh, just again, this Vatican-China deal. So now what's happened under this is that um, uh, the Pope has recognized the remaining bishops of the patriotic church that hadn't previously been recognized. And now going forward, um, Beijing and the Holy See are supposed to work in collaboration, I think, in the appointment of bishops, how do you assess um, the agreement and its wisdom? So the, the problem is, first of all, the, I mean, no country can claim that it's been 100% faithful in upholding all its treaties and deals and, and bargains. So um, I'm not gonna suggest the Chinese are the only ones, but the Chinese are egregious and communists are egregious. Um, they say simply conditions have changed and so that you the deal that you thought you had has changed and uh there is as i was saying earlier there's just no possibility that the chinese will cede any kind of authority to what they see as a foreign and potentially threatening organization so what's happened so far is that bishops who were, were previously seen as, as you know, schismatic, um, have become regularized. We looked the other way on some people who, who had done some things that would have disqualified them from being priests. So that's, that's problematic. There's also not much evidence that the Chinese have honored this idea that the, 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 idea, the nominations come, come from Rome. In fact, it seems that the nominations come from Beijing and there's not much follow-up with Rome either. In fact, the latest directive that came out after the, the agreement was renewed doesn't say anything about the Vatican or the Pope. And on the ground, we've seen Catholic churches caught up as all churches and all religious institutions are in China in this in arrests and harassment and uh, the destruction of, of property. It's not as bad as what's happening to the Muslims, but it's, it's not great. And then perhaps most threatening for the Catholics and, and, and indeed for Protestants too, is uh, there's an age limit. You, you, people under 18 aren't allowed into church hmm. and you have to sign agreements that should say that you're a patriotic Chinese person and uphold everything the Chinese state does to get into the church and you're tracked as a member of the church. And even the iconography in churches, including Catholic churches, is the iconography of the communist state increasingly. There are Xi Jinping notices and, 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 and signs and, and pictures of, of Xi inside, uh, inside the church. So sinicization is really the kind of evisceration of uh, Catholicism as we know it. So I think it has been a disaster and it's also a disaster in that the Vatican has unwisely decided that the way to get the best deal is not to speak about some of the unspeakable things that China is doing, not just to Catholics, but to people of faith, to democracy, to, to countries like uh, Hong Kong, where they had made some commitments to the evolution of, of society, to the outrageous things that China is doing. And what was No, I was, I, I was going to say that a kind of good litmus test now coming up is Hong Kong, you know, what you just mentioned, which is, uh, you know, there's a vacancy there, so far as I know. And uh, so at a certain point, the bishop is going to get appointed. And will the Vatican be meaningfully consulted at all for that? That's, that's a great concern. After I retired from um, my public service life, I, I spent three years running uh, the Catholic University that's affiliated with the University of Toronto, the University of St. Michael's College. And mm -hmm. so my three years of university life uh, contributed to uh, the color of my hair. 
Uh, it's <laughs> modern universities, especially Catholic ones, are harrowing places. But um, I tried to. Uh, I didn't have any expertise running a university, and this one was just uh, the, the priests who ran it had also educated me, so they they found me. Uh, and the only thing I thought I could bring to it was some experience, my government experience, maybe that could work. And um, I, I tried to invite interesting international figures. And we had Cardinal Zen, who is the very honest, faithful, hardworking, now, uh, you know, uh, former, uh, he's, he's past his retirement age, he's over 80, Cardinal of Hong Kong, who's been a fearless critic of mm -hmm. China, who knows China well from his own days mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, and who has spoken out eloquently. Sadly, he he traveled to to China. I think it was well just before the pandemic to have one last audience with Pope Francis to to speak mm -hmm. his mind, and he, he didn't even get a meeting. So Hong Kong is the, the Hong Kong. The interesting thing there were some very important people in Hong Kong who are Catholics, including, unfortunately, Carrie Lam, who is the uh, Beijing-leaning leader of Hong Kong. Mm, but mm. Uh, people like Martin Lee, the champion of the democratic movement, Jimmy Lai, a business person who's put all his, you know, mm -hmm. his sort of wealth on the line to support democracy. There are lots of Catholics who are watching the church in Hong Kong, but it too appears to be silent. And this is what gets to me, this is what I think is the most costly and damaging thing that's happening is that in, in pursuing some, what I think is pie in the sky solution with the Chinese that they're never going to agree to ultimately, the church has lost sight of the audience it needs to speak to most, and that is the people of China and particularly the Catholics of China. People mm -hmm. don't respond to your diplomatic skills or your, you know, your pursuit of a political deal they, they respond to heroism. So when Cardinal Kung picked up the microphone and said, long live Christ the King, it cost him dearly, but I'm sure that resonated in the hearts of China's Catholics and kept their faith alive in the, the during the Cultural Revolution, which was uh, an abysmal time. Yeah, you see, I've, I've heard it said, um, it's easy for us in the West to expect Chinese Catholics to suffer for their faith um, because we have a much softer kind of existence in this part of the world. and. Um, if we take that kind of a line, um, you know, Chinese Catholics will suffer and we in the West won't suffer. And it's kind of an indulgent kind of line to take. So what would you say about that? Well, unfortunately, it is people of faith in many parts of the world are, are suffering and we can't mm. be indifferent to it. And we should be willing, and one of the things that holds us back is, is the, the kind of economic imperative that you spoke about earlier. We're not even uh, prepared to run the risk of losing uh, some exports or investment. So uh, we can't share everything that the Chinese are sharing, but we should be willing uh, to take on China and put at risk whatever advantages we see to speak honestly about religious freedom. One of the great frustrations I have with my own government here in Canada is that unlike their predecessors who had, who had taken religious freedom seriously and in fact created for the first time an ambassador for religious freedom, I was lucky enough to be ambassador during that period and we did a lot of outreach to religious groups. We had mass mm -hmm. for the international community when they couldn't find a place to have mass. I mean, it was a wonderful time to show that Canadians supported religious freedom um, this was immediately shut down by uh, the new government, the, the, the liberal government. Mm -hmm. It also didn't get much take up from uh, Western Europe. And I'm sorry to say, including the part of Western Europe where you're sitting right now, that if Western democracies were willing to add religious freedom to their list of dialogue topics with China and work together, we might make the Chinese think twice about what they're doing so brazenly. But, mm -hmm. you know, what I found when the conservatives introduced religious freedom in Canada as a diplomatic objective. My own colleagues, my progressive colleagues in the foreign ministry said, mm. well, are we going to have freedom to, to you know, not believe? And I said, well, the freedom not to believe is pretty uh, available in China. That's not the problem <laughs> in the world today. Mm. So unless we take it seriously and, and are willing to, to put at risk some of the benefits we derive you know, comfortably from China, we can't be of any help whatsoever.
So just a final question. Um, what do you think the Vatican's approach to China should be going forward? I think the Vatican's approach, now having done these deals, it's, it's, maybe it's time to undo the deals, uh, and it should be to resolutely insist on the Pope's prerogative and responsibility for naming bishops, and that these bishops have to be men of the highest moral standing. We can't allow people who are unfit to be bishops, you know, exercise authority in China. That may mean, and, and probably will mean, that the deal gets broken and uh, the, the, what remains of the patriotic church, because it, since the deal has been done, the Chinese have been insisting that uh, members of the, sorry, members of the underground church have to register with the patriotic church. What remains of the underground church needs to be strengthened. The reality is, as much as the regime can control things, they can't control everything. And people have access to news and information and messages in ways that they didn't before. The Protestants were busy uh, smuggling in Bibles when we were still thinking about how to, to do our deal with China. So we need to mm -hmm. think about speaking honestly, speaking the truth, speaking out. You know, the, back in May of last year, it appears that the Pope changed his remarks after the Angelus to eliminate uh, comments that he was supposed to make about Hong Kong, he's got to stop doing that. As, as difficult yeah. as it is, people will be inspired by words of truth. And we, mm -hmm. he, he needs, the Vatican diplomats should be working with Canada and Ireland, not China, to get mm -hmm. us to be a little bit more forthright in defending religious freedom. It's not easy. It's a very difficult situation. But China, the Communist Party will not last forever. And when the mm -hmm. Chinese people emerge finally to be free, and I fervently believe that they will, they will remember who stood for freedom and who stood with the party. And I mm -hmm. want the, the church should be identified with this rigorous honesty and, and fidelity to the gospel and fidelity to the faithful. And, and it's not doing that now. Okay, well, that's a perfect note to end it on. So uh, thank you for your time, David. It's been a real pleasure to interview you and an honour to interview you as well. So thank Always you. a pleasure to chat, David. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.